So a few years ago, I was sitting in my home office, looking out the front window uh, toward the street, and suddenly I saw a Travis County police car pull up in front of my driveway, essentially blocking it. And I watched as a plainclothes detective got out of his, the car and came up in the middle of my driveway and was looking in my garage. Well, I immediately called for Scott and said, honey, there's a cop in our driveway looking for in our garage. And he re literally rushed outside to meet him. Now, the detective must have been asking Scott some really weird questions because I could see Scott was talking very animated and he kept shaking his head no, but I couldn't hear what he was saying. So finally, Scott comes in the house and he looks at me and he has a goofy smile on his face and he says, honey, the detective wants to talk to you. I bet you know what my stomach did right then and there, so I walked outside. Now, let me tell you, this detective, he was on a mission. He abruptly stated his name and asked if I was, in fact, Holly Hoppy, to which I replied, yes. Then he asked what my address, if this was where I lived and what I did as an occupation. And I said, yes, this is where I live and I'm a Presbyterian minister. In fact, I even had a vacation Bible school shirt on. <laughs> and then he said, I want to know about your brother. That was when I saw Scott smile. And I looked at the cop and I said, I don't have a brother. To which he looked back at me with very narrowed eyes and he said, yes, you do. And his name is Paul Hoppy. So I shot back, no, I don't. I have four sisters named Cindy, Sherry, Lori, and Linda. And my maiden name is Hasted, so it's kind of impossible that I would have a biological brother named Paul Hoppy. Well, this stubborn guy, he wouldn't believe me. He just wouldn't believe me. And we went back and forth and back and forth for several minutes until he finally said, look, your bro brother is a known drug dealer whom we have been following for weeks. And we happen to know that he is hidden in your house. And I am going to arrest you for harboring a fugitive. Well, we went back and forth a few more times until he finally said, come with me. He opens the cop car door, get in. I'm not going to get in this cop car door. So he opens the front door. And he said, slide in and look at my computer. It'll tell you. He said, right there, it says, Paul Hoppy, armed and dangerous, known to be with his sister, Holly Hoppy. Well, I slid in. And as I looked at the screen, I started laughing. The detective was very unimpressed with my laughter. And he said, what are you laughing about? I said, well, sir, I believe we have a case of mistaken identity. Your screen says Paul Hoppy is with his sister Polly Hoppy with a P, not Holly Hoppy with an H. He was so shocked, he slid in right next to me on the seat, <laughs> and he leaned over and he looked at the screen, and he looked over and he got right this close to my face and said, oops. <laughs> And then he said, and I even have backup waiting at the end of your street. <laughs> so he slid out of the car, and he helped me out, and he bowed his head kind of sheepishly, and he looked at me, and he said, ma'am, yeah, are you really a preacher? <laughs> yeah, I'm a preacher. Well, then you'll have to forgive me, right? <laughs> and I held out my hand, and we shook hands, and Scott and I laughed as the guy and all his backup drove down the street. Mistaken identity. Has anybody else been, ever been mistaken for somebody else? Yeah, it, it, occasionally, it occasionally happens, but it's happening more and more today with computers and things that we can obviously misread a screen on. But what about those times when our identities aren't mistaken? 
What about those times where we lose our identity altogether? Today we're in week four of our series of finding your way back to God through five spiritual awakenings. And this week is all about finding our identity as children of God. For those of you who may have missed, we're going to do a really quick recap. The first week was awakening to longing. And that is about all the longings in our life where we long for a deeper purpose. And we long to feel loved and be loved and give love. These longings can either draw us closer to God or push us farther away from God, depending on how we choose to fulfill them. The second awakening is awakening to regret. And that helps us recognize that in our attempt to fulfill our longings all on our own, they usually drive us farther down a path of destruction and away from God. Even when we come to our senses, sometimes we get lost in that sorry cycle of regret and we never move beyond it. We explored two Greek words. The first word, two Greek words for life. The first was the bio life. If you remember and you were here, that's the biological life. The things you do, you eat, you drink, you sleep, you work. But then we explored the zoe life, which was the life of purpose, the life of love, the life that God designed us for. Then last week, we explored the awakening to help. And this was very important. Because the way we get out of our cycle of regret was when we finally humble ourselves and say, God, I need you to help me. We find that there is no other help to get us motivated out of our regret until we ask God for that help. And God will help us and God will provide people to help us walk the journey. Well, this leads us where we are today. We've come home only to realize that we're home, but the journey isn't over. Because we realize that while we're home, suddenly everything still isn't fixed. We've had a life-changing moment, but there's still too many things going against us. This is because through our negative experiences, we've forgotten who we are. And we have lost our true identity. And that's why we have the fourth awakening. The awakening to love. Because when we awaken to love, it holds the secret key that unlocks the door to that Zoe purposeful life of love that we so desperately crave. So in the story that Scott read today, we find that our illustrious prodigal has finally returned home. But like I said, his journey isn't over because everything is not right in his world. He's still living within his own mistaken identity and what he thinks of himself. If you remember, the father looks out and sees him on the horizon. And the father is so filled with joy that he runs like almost with reckless abandonment. And he throws his arms around his son. He doesn't care about what other people think of him. He's hugging his son and it even says it showers him with kisses. Now, I want to stop in this beautiful moment right here. Just picture that. What that love looks like. But I want to look at the son's response. He doesn't jump up and down for joy because dad's welcomed him home. He doesn't cry tears of happiness because he gets to come home after this life of bad choices he's made. In fact, the son can't even see his father's joy. Listen to the very first words he utters. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Even after he sees the father run to him with mercy and compassion, even after being embraced in huge hugs and showered with kisses, even after all the unmistakable signs of the father's love and grace, the son's opinion of himself cannot catch up to reality. He cannot believe in any way, shape, or form that his true identity is that of a child who is deeply loved. You know, I can tell you, I've been in this position 
more times than I would like to admit in life. I recognize that I have made some horrible choices and I have really messed up. And you know what I feel each time I do that? It's not love. It's mountains upon mountains of shame filling me with doubt and leading me to believe that I will never be worthy of God's embrace. And this, my friends, this is exactly how shame works. The son was filled with shame. It's why he couldn't see his father's compassion. And shame is that nasty emotion that sticks to us like glue and follows us home. Shame is the shadow, the dark shadow that is cast over this homecoming. Shame wants us to forget who we really are. And shame loves to whisper us, <laughs> You don't deserve that. You're not good enough for this. Even when we come home, we have to awaken to God's love because it is God's love that wipes out shame. You see, while the son was still shaking his head in shame, insisting he's not worthy of his father's love, the father's yelling to his servants, quick, bring the best robe. And let's put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. The son's head had to be spinning. No, 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 dad. I don't deserve any of this. And to us, these gifts might seem odd. But each of these gifts conveyed a powerful symbol of the Father's love, and an even deeper symbol within the culture for all those what I like to call looky-loos, the people that were watching what was going on. First, the robe is a symbol of rest. At the Father's command, he commands not just a robe be brought to the Son, but the best robe be brought to the Son. Now, back then, the best robe was owned by the owner of the house, which meant the father was giving his most prized possession that he had to his son. Think of how that would feel, to be enveloped by that father's robe. It'd make you feel like you don't have to run anymore, like you don't have to prove to yourself anymore. And above all, to be wrapped in a robe like that meant you could finally stop and rest. The second was the ring. Now back then, a ring was a symbol of security. You might remember all throughout history, when you greet a king, what do you have to do? You have to kiss a ring. And that is the sign of the king's authority. It is a sign that is symbolic of power. So when the father brings his best, gets his best ring and gives it to his son, the father's power is being transferred to the son. And this power is that he will never want for anything again. Not a place to lay his head, not a place to anything to eat, but most of all, he will never want love again. It was the ring that seals with security the son's identity as loved by the father. Now finally we have the sandals. The sandals are a sign of acceptance. In the ancient Jewish home, just like the robe, the only ones that wore sandals were the owner of the home and the owner's family. If you were a slave or a servant, you went barefoot. Now if I have to imagine, if this son is coming home after living the life he did, he was dirty, he was destitute, and he was probably barefoot. So when the father gives his son the sandals and says, welcome home, he's also saying, you know what, son? You are not my slave. You are not my servant. You are my son. So as you can see, these three gifts are what bring to light to the son what his true identity was. He was loved. He was no longer a stranger or a loser. He wasn't a slave or a hired hand. This son was forgiven and free. And that, friends, that 
is our prodigal's true identity. You know, this week as I was reflecting on this story, it's been interesting to read this story for five weeks straight and really reflect on it. I realized how often I am that prodigal daughter. I've spent more time than I would ever like living under the shadow of shame, and I've lost my true identity more times than I can count. I am a pro at carrying around regrets. Regrets from the past, past many years, regrets from the past year, regrets from the past week. Maybe as you sit here, you think the same thing. Maybe you think of those times, maybe you're in there now where you don't feel worthy of God's love. And that's why we have to look at this story this way and look at the love of God as something that happens to us over and over again because love is the way that we are able to throw off that shadow of shame and realize that God has forgiven us and loves us deeply after all. So my friends, if you don't hear anything else today, I want you to hear this. Awakening to the amazing love of God is the Zoe life. It is our purpose in life. It's what we hold close and it's what we are supposed to help share with others. It's what we're made for. And you know what? If we allow that love of God into our life, it can and will fuel absolutely everything we do. I can honestly say that this is truly, when I feel that love of God, it is the most amazing feeling that there ever is. Because I've experienced it more than once, including once this week. Awakening to the love of God is what tells us that we do not find our identity in our jobs or our wealth or our poverty or our body types, or our addictions, or our mistakes, or our relationships with others, or our anxiety, or our doubt, or our anger, or our abuse, or our fear, or our illness, or our nation, or world tragedies, or anything that does its best to try to pull us away from the love of God. Because friends, nothing, nothing in life or death can pull us from the love of God. And that is our true identity. We are loved children of God. So if in this amazing love, if you want to feel this amazing love, let's get started right now. I want you to repeat after me. God, if you are real, make yourself real to me. Awaken in me the confidence that I can live a brand new life. Brothers and sisters, right here, right now, you are home with the arms of God waiting to welcome you to run in and get that hug. We need to celebrate that and be at peace. Let us pray. Oh God, you long for us. You long for us to run into your arms. And so often we run the other way. Whether it's our fear, our pride, our desires. And then we feel like we are no longer worthy of your love. And how wrong we are. We ask, Lord, that you make yourself real to each of us so that we can look at you and know that we are forgiven, free, and deeply loved and run home into your arms over and over again for as many times as it takes to believe that you love us just the way we are. In your name we pray. Amen.